the button right now. And I'll pass it well, on. Well, at least, at least if it's coming down from the unit above, it Oops, is Kathy, likely I'm just, just one. You, darling. All right. Um, did I get everybody? I think so. Okay, fabulous. Um, I'm just going to pass it over to Corey, our president, to um, say a few words, and then uh, we'll get back to it. Great, thank you, Maria. Uh, so, um, hi everyone, I'm Corey Klein, I'm the president of OCME. I'm down here at St. Clair College in Windsor. Um, don't want to, to uh, make everyone jealous, but we're predicting 20 degrees uh, for the uh, the weekend. Um, so, uh, but because we're here, it'll probably snow on Monday because that's just the way things work. Um, so we are here with our 2022 winter PD. Um, somehow it got to March. But now that, you know, we've been in lockdown for who knows how many years now, and I really don't know how we got to 2022. It, it just seems like, you know, yesterday was 2020, but we're all here. It's nice to see people's faces again and hear them. And very, very soon, we hope to have um, people uh, in person and being able to meet them again. Uh, so uh, nothing wrong with the Zooms or anything like that, but, you know, um, we, uh, uh, our, our strengths are, you know, being together, uh, and we hope to have that soon. So today we have for you um, a, a frequent uh, visitor to um, our OCMA uh, conferences. Um, if you have to remember, she's one of those very strange people who likes to go running in, in the morning. Um, and, well, first off, getting getting uh, up that early is it's just weird enough, let alone be the running bit. Um, but uh, today, um, what I always found interesting is that uh, she teaches math to um, an area where we don't normally teach math, because uh, she teaches in, in the uh, community studies, in the emergency services areas. Uh, and these are people who definitely need math in their jobs, and they're probably quite afraid of math when they, when they are going out and preparing for their careers. Uh, and uh, luckily that they do have a, a math professor to help them uh, in order to go through those. So um, we are going to be hearing. Yeah, just one second. Actually, I've, I've lost your little bio. So actually, we'll have Heather uh, give her own little bio. So we're going to be hearing from Heather Milburn, uh, who is up at Durham College. And she is going to be uh, telling us how she reaches these students um, who are, you know, our non-traditional math students. And hopefully we'll be able to take uh, those things um, and help them in, uh, help any of our students that we happen to see. So um, we'll be hearing from Heather. Just before that happens, Maria will be giving some, uh, some basic um, uh, housekeeping uh, in order for this session to be uh, as smooth as possible. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, Corey. Uh, I'll be super quick, everyone. So again, just a reminder for those that joined us uh, in the last minute or two, we are recording the session and it will be posted on the OCMA website. So those of you that would like to watch it again um, can do so. And we'll also include the slides that Heather will be using today, as well as any links um, or bits of important information that you'd like to look into afterwards. So during the presentation, we ask that you, um, you can turn your cameras off and mute uh, your mics uh, so that we can have a smooth flow and hearing opportunities for everybody. What will happen is as we're going through the session, Heather will have moments uh, where we can have discussion. So by all means, if there's anything that pops into your mind as we're going through, please feel free to put the, the questions in the chat. Uh, Derek and I will be monitoring that as well as Heather will be as well. Uh, and we're also going to have opportunity at the end of the session to um, have discussion, further discussion and dive in a little bit deeper to anything that you'd like to do so. And at that point, we encourage you um, to, again, use the chat, put your hands up, unmute your mics, um, put your cameras back on and we can have those wholesome discussions. Um, so without, for, oh, and just one final reminder as well that after the session later today, I'll be sending all of the participants a link so that you can claim your uh, badge, your participation badge for this PD session from CanCred. Okay, so without further ado, Heather, over to you. Thank you so much, Maria and Corey. And uh, thank you everybody for being here today. I'm excited to share and join in discussion. And it's just great to talk to other math people. Uh, like Corey was saying, I am the sole math person in my school. I'm at the School of uh, 
Justice and Emergency Services at Durham College, which is in uh, East End of the GTA in Oshawa. And it's sort of a, a weird spot to be as a math person because all of my peers in the school are like, oh, you teach math. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm like, no, this is great. I love it. And they, they think I'm a bit weird. So it's great to be uh, around people who uh, appreciate math for what it is and that I'm able to share sort of my excitement and what I'm doing. I, I tend to talk about what I'm doing in my math classes in my program meetings and people are always like, oh, but that's for math. And I think a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about today is shaped by the fact that I talk with a lot of um, interdisciplinary groups and getting that idea of bringing the power of different uh, modalities into our classrooms is something that can really support our students. So um, that's sort of the goal for today. I've been teaching at Durham College for over 10 years now and uh, generally teach the math for, like Corey was mentioning, uh, the emergency services students. So these are ones who are looking to get into paramedicine, as well as I work with 911 operators and the uh, fire life safety program, which do inspections for sprinkler systems and the electrical panels. So sort of specialized areas that we might see in some of the other courses, but now in sort of that justice area. But I do have an opportunity sometimes to work in upgrading and interdisciplinary as well, just to get a little bit more <laughs> pure math in the college setting. So plan for today is I'm hoping to share and also hear from you some thoughts and ideas regarding getting our students thinking, getting our students self-regulating in our classes. I'm gonna go over some of the ways that I've tried this. And then also some of the ways that uh, you might think about adding some support for your students in your class and uh, it may be a, a bit of inspiration here. I find some of these things might be things that you've tried before and you might just not have had a name for them. And I find that being able to talk about certain ideas can sort of gather that thought that might have been in the back of your head. It, and I, I find it helps with sort of that creativity and innovative teaching practices, the more we share, the more we can sort of connect those dots together. So on that note, plan for today, I've already sort of started into my rationale, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more of sort of where I'm coming from and what my, my goals were. I'm gonna define what exactly is self-regulated learning, why we should care or what, what type of idea that is. Uh, go through some examples that I've used in my own personal practice, how that went, and then uh, end off with some strategies that you might consider using different levels of intervention, trying to keep things sort of less work intensive, some low effort um, ideas that you may be able to use even in the end of the semester without having to do a large rework. So that is the plan for today. Um, so... I've been uh, thinking about things for a while. Like I mentioned, I'm in program teams with uh, professors from different focuses and we talk a lot about our students. And one thing that we've been, I've been noticing coming up in discussions a lot more recently is the idea of learned helplessness where students come in and you get that, that bit of a blank stare or they, I, I've had students come in with nothing <laughs> and then they just sit there and they don't, start. They don't start. They don't come prepared. It's like they're waiting to be told exactly what to be done. And once they've gotten material, they're like, should I take notes on this? Or should I um, write this down? The idea that they're waiting for someone to tell them exactly what to do. Um, I found that moving online, this was really highlighted because in the class, you can sort of see these students and maybe help encourage them, but there was sort of a block of students while teaching online that, well, with online, you sort of have to have a bit of that self-starting ability. And if somebody wasn't there to say, now you should do this, now you should do that, there was a block of students that were getting lost along the way. And this sort of, this got me thinking. Um, learned helplessness is sort of a way of talking about this, but is this something that you've experienced in your classes as well, that students come in and they're not um, sort of ready or they're, they're really waiting for somebody else to take the reins? Yeah. 
had a feeling it, would, it wasn't just at our college, but you never know. But yeah, and last year, I, I would agree, Laura, that it has been something that I've been noticing more in recent years. And even this year, transitioning to in-person, like we came back to being in-person um, after January. And with some of my students as well, it's sort of with the shift and the changes that sort of a bit of deer in the headlights um, from that shift. I'm like, what am I supposed to do now? And definitely, yeah, that online portion I found really highlighted for me how a lot of students just don't know how to get started. They don't know what they're supposed to do. So this got me thinking, I'm like, okay, well, if there's problems, it doesn't have to be a problem. It could also be an opportunity. So thinking about, well, I want my students to be as successful as possible. That's my, my general personal mantra. I want them to be successful. I want them to um, find math to not be as potentially discouraging as it can be. And I started looking around, how could I promote my students in their learning, in their critical thinking? That's a buzzword that's out there a lot right now, and it's self-advocacy. Because, well, I have them just for math, but they're in other courses as well. And can I support them in not just achieving their math learning outcomes, but also gaining skills that are going to help them widely. This sort of ties into those essential employability skills in general, but we've been hearing a lot um, in our college, that idea of resiliency and that idea of being able to be a self-starter. And these are things that industry are looking for. They're looking for creative thinkers. They're looking for students who can um, be self-starters and have that independence. So, I thought, well, I'd be doing my students a disservice if I don't at least look into this and figure out a way that I can support that in our class. And yes, I know at first I think, well, that's not my job as a math teacher. I, I'm supposed to teach them math. We do numeracy, we do um, calculations, we do processes, maybe critical thinking because and problem solving makes sense in there. But that idea of that more metacognitive psychology that should be in a psychology class. That should be in a learning skills class. But I think that math class can be the right spot for this as well, because students expect math to be hard. They expect that they're going to have to work on it. So if we have a place where students are able to do work and they're expecting to do work, it's a great spot that we can model and show different ways that they can learn to learn. And also we can give them some explicit learning outcome spots with questions that have that objective answer so they can really see their progress. Sometimes in some of the softer skill courses, it can be harder for students to realize, am I actually getting this? Am I making that progress? So if we could put it in a course like math where they're able to see that progress a little bit better, a little bit more black and white, it can really help promote their ability to learn. And so they're sort of getting a two for one. They're getting those numeracy skills that we want them to have, but also gaining that confidence and being able to work um, with their own learning. So all of that led me to the idea of self-regulated learning. I, again, wanted to support my students, looked at different methodologies. I've been doing some um, master's courses and it's all about innovation, innovation in curriculum design, innovative curriculum. And then when I start reading about it, some of them seem pretty straightforward. Some of the things that we're through discussions we're already doing, but it's nice to sort of have a name to something because then it allows me to find more examples, more research, more things to support the why am I doing this and help share with my students why we're doing this as well. So before I jump in talking about what self-regulated learning is, I was wondering if this was something that you have heard about before or not. So I'm going to be bringing up a Mentimeter. I'm going to put in the chat a link to the question and I'll bring this up here just for a spot anonymous to put in what do you already know about self-regulated learning if you don't know anything that is fine too that's partly what we're going to be talking about here but uh do you know anything about what it means uh, some of you were here in October glad to have you back That sounds like an excellent resource, Cassia. I've seen that on my list, but I haven't had a chance to go through it. And I'm gonna now move that to higher in my list. 
because that to me is really interesting as well that cognitive research on psychology and how to learn and um, growth growth mindset definitely yeah, so getting some responses here Heather, if you, I'm just gonna, while we're waiting for people to respond, there's a couple of folks um, that are joining us and I'm just capturing people's names so I can send the badges after, but some of the names um, are not clear. Like there's just initials. So for those of you that um, have just the initials or it's not easy for me to identify, could you just send me a message either through Zoom or on email so I know who you are, or you can just right click and uh, rename yourself. And that way I can make sure I've got everybody captured. Okay, thanks so much guys. Sorry about that, Heather. Oh, perfect. And great, we're getting some good responses here. I'm just looking over. So some of you came to my session in October. Thanks for coming back and trusting me again with your time. Um, some of you, I see some self-based learning uh, mentioned in chat currently. Laura is currently reading a book on self-regulated learning. Do feel free to share if it's a good one. Always looking for some more titles. It's reading week, it's time for reading. Yeah, behavior, managing yourself in this amount of time, self-pacing, mastering learning. And this, I like the cyclical one down here is what I'm gonna be talking about, using strategy and setting goals. And ho hope you, hopefully for those of you who don't know much, it would be great to know a little bit more by the end of today. And I like that, that phrase as well, somebody highlighted over here, academic hygiene, a good overall practice and attitude to support independent learning. Yeah, definitely. Perfect, thank you for sharing. And um, I'm just gonna bring us back over here. And the, what mentioned in there, that idea of self-discipline, that idea of learning being a process is exactly what I'm looking at here with self-regulated learning. So I liked this quote at the top, learning is not, is not something that happens to students, it's something that happens by students. So with that idea of our students coming, sometimes now a little bit less prepared to know how to learn, they are, um, expecting things to be fed to them. They're expecting sort of, you're the teacher, teach me, as opposed to realizing that that phrase can be flipped. I'm the student, I should be learning. I should be working at my learning. And the idea with self-regulated learning is it focuses on students being aware and in control of their learning process. It's turning that back around and being able to, um, students to realize that they are in control of their learning process and they learning is a skill. Uh, I find it amazing sometimes, and I'll go through some examples as we're talking here, that students don't realize that they can get better at learning. It's um, maybe not just only a skill, but it's a process. And so the idea here is there's a cycle where students are modeled or learn that they can take certain strategies, develop their own personal toolkit, plan what they're going to do. So goal setting is something that's important with self-regulated learning. And then um, also once they set a goal, once they set a plan, putting the plan in process and then have, having self-monitoring tools. Am I getting this? Do I understand what's happening? Is this working for me? And then afterwards um, having a chance to reflect on how things went and revise. So a lot of self-regulated learning, it seems to have a phrase of for the things that we do when we learn something. Uh, we say, what don't I understand? How could I understand that? Do What do I know going in? And then using certain strategies for when you're reading, for when you're taking information in, and then realizing how did that go? How might I adjust that later? And so the idea with this process is allowing students to think um, and see that they're in control of this process and they can develop the tools that are going to support them in their learning. All right, so certain things that are beneficial when considering self-regulated learning in your classroom is student engagement. So on one hand, if your students aren't engaged, it's gonna be hard to sort of help them with the self-regulated learning process, but it is something that feeds on itself. So if you can show students that 
I'm able to learn something, I'm able to do something and it's gonna benefit myself, it feeds student engagement. I've seen quotes in some of my readings from students realizing, oh, I have the ability to engage my brain. I have the ability to learn this and it is an empowering uh, example for them. And seeing that sort of this can work idea leads to more engagement. Having learning be turned back on the student helps add to their own motivation and also their personal relevance. Some tools are having students think about why should I care about this? It has them explicitly ask those questions. Why might this help me in my future? How have I seen this before? How could this help me in my everyday life? So by encouraging them to implement that into their thought process, they're not just again waiting for you to say, well, why is this important? Why should I care? It's again, getting them to think about that for themselves. And some of those buzzwords that I've been seeing again, it, responsibility, reasoning, and resiliency. These are items that are both supported and developed through setting up self-regulated learning practices into uh, the classroom. So students learn that it's not just the teacher's job to teach, but they as the student have an important role reasoning skills, so realizing what can I do, and that idea of resiliency. It's been a, a lot of things with students who are struggling show they hit a wall and they don't know what to do because they don't have that background skills of how can I deal with something when it doesn't go right. So by setting up and helping them see this learning cycle, it takes time, it takes process, um, can help with that idea of being able to work through problems. Okay, in addition to just qualitative reports, some interesting items, there's, there's more, but this one I thought was really interesting is the idea of practicing retrieving. I was meeting with a student last week uh, talking about homework. And she's like, I, I go to do my homework and I don't remember how to do it. And I'm like, well, that's the idea with homework is you, you get that practice of retrieving, of recalling the information. She's like, oh, I never thought about that. I need to practice remembering something. And it's true. If students don't know about something, they don't know about something. And sometimes it's easy to take for granted, but by encouraging or giving opportunities for students to practice recalling, practice retrieving information is one of the most important in learning the science uh, for assessment that students are gonna be able to recall is if they've practiced recalling. If they've just sat there, taken information in, read something, their ability to recall that later is, well, they haven't reinforced it. So by explicitly helping them see, okay, you can maybe repeat your readings, you can maybe set up a concept map for a graphic, and you can see here some of the best results from reading, trying, and then repeating. So reading something, trying to recall, what did I understand, and then repeating. So just putting in a bit of that practice can improve students' recall in a testing situation. And so that's just a, a, a small activity, but students being aware of what they can do can help them take back that control of their learning and empower them to do better. So armed with all of this, here's a bit of what I uh, thought about doing or what I did try and do. Some of these are things that I did while being online. And some of you mentioned in the mentee that you came to my presentation in October. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. And some of this as well were things that um, I'm hoping to adjust and try now moving back to being in person again as well. And um, again, seeing the different parts. The interesting thing with the opportunity with being online is there isn't a lot of research, as much research with online learning. So I'm hoping again to see with flipped models or things like that, if I can continue researching. And I haven't done the formalized research on a lot of this, but it's giving me ideas and I'm hoping to do a little bit more going forward. And yeah, definitely looking forward to these great resources here. I find this topic is really interesting to read about. So if this is sort of getting you thinking, definitely recommend taking a look. Cognitive psychology and the science of learning is something that I've been reading a lot more about right now, and it sounds like you guys have been thinking about it as well. So definitely recommend thinking about it because I find even just putting in some small ideas into what you're doing can make a big impact for our students just feeling comfortable in the class and also being successful.
So here's some things that I tried um, in my own classroom. These ones here were with, well, in a couple different settings. So one is entry tickets. I also did some exit tickets as well. But the idea with a uh, entry ticket is I'd have students do an activity before class. So that could be a reading. It could be they had to do a certain bit of homework or some sort of activity before class and have to submit an entry ticket. And that entry ticket wasn't just a quiz on the what they learned. It was more, uh, did I understand what happened in the reading? Or do I have any questions coming into class? So it wasn't just a skill check or a knowledge check. It was more, how was the student feeling about what they had learned? And this is modeling an idea of students being aware of, do I understand this? Asking that question to themselves instead of just tr trying <laughs> to, to do the skill, thinking about, did, did I actually get this? What do I have questions about? Um, why might I be learning this? So sort of planting those questions into their thoughts before class started. Some examples of entry tickets that I did um, back a couple of years, I think Stephanie did a talk on math anxiety and having a guided math imagery uh, talk through. So that's something that I have my students read through and uh, use this entry ticket. What was useful to me? What can I take away from this? I've also used uh, growth mindset readings before class as well. So getting them thinking about um, you're not where you are with what you're learning. You're able to grow and you're able to make changes. So it doesn't just have to be readings on math. It could be sort of that outside thinking about thinking thinking about learning uh, readings, just to get them thinking about, oh, I am in control of my learning here. I do have the ability to put myself in a positive headspace before coming to class. And I, I use those as part of my participation or in-process grades to encourage students to do them. Of course, not everybody's going to do them, but give a bit of an encouragement there. And then another one that I tried um, this past semester was a weekly reflection space. So this actually alternated between being a um, Flipgrid video and being a discussion board posting. So students were encouraged to reflect on what went well during the week, but didn't go well, and um, what they might do to get better at things they were struggling with or tips they had for their peers for what helped them better understand things. And this became a good sharing space throughout the course where students would talk about, well, this, this skill I really struggled with. These were things that I found useful this week. Uh, it was great to see students say, I, I actually came to the live help sessions and it was really helpful for me and other students reading that. It's, it's nice to hear it from a student instead of me telling them that, but it gave them a chance to um, gain some positive ability with their course. I did that course was with an upgrading uh, course that was through our interdisciplinary school where students had been sort of dropped out of their university program and needed to improve before they could come back. So these are students who had a, a motivation to do well. And it was interesting to see how they were able to sort of channel that through their weekly reflections. Okay, so how did all that go? Well, I thought pretty well this past semester. Again, it was a one time through and I'm hoping to be able to do this type of idea again because I found it wasn't too much to set up and it was a great way to develop a feedback relationship with the student because they would weekly put out their thoughts there and I was able to highlight areas that they were continually struggling with and maybe give them more resources. But then also their peers were able to chime in as well and it helped create that sense of connectivity that we've talked about in previous sessions um, through the OCMA. And this is just one quote from one reflection, but it was great to see students coming to ideas themselves about how practicing and having a consistent practice plan is important. I, I try to say things in my class about, if you're not quite sure how to do this, how might you get better? Um, talking about how repetitions and retrieval, but it's it's nice to see in the reflections if students are actually picking up on that and actually hearing the things that you are saying to them. Interesting looking through the results uh, at the end of the course and taking a look at some of the sort of the data points. Again, I need to maybe do a more 
formal statistical breakdown, but just looking through, um, I noticed that students, because it wasn't optional to do these reflections, the ones who did choose to do the regular reflections had more attempts of their homework problems. So the homework was set up that there was a practice homework quiz and then the actual one, but they could do the practice one as many times. And the questions were arithmetic style generated ones in the learning management system we have at D2L. And so um, when those questions were generated on the practice one, it was the same style questions that would be on the actual weekly quiz. And they could attempt it. Some students would just do the other ones and be done. And then um, they could go and do the quiz. Question here about whether it was free flowing or if it was posed by you. So for the reflections, I had a general um, reflect on how things went this week and I had some cues. So you might think about what went well, you might think about what didn't go well. So, and the cue was the same every week and they sort of went with that. Um, I, yeah, I included a couple prompts just to get them thinking. And I also did a reflection the first week, um, showing my reflection just to give them an idea of what could be involved. I could have done it more week by week, and that might be something that I consider. And I'm going to talk about that later too, how um, including yourself in the dialogue of learning can be beneficial. But yeah, it was a, a the same every week post, reflect on how things went and uh, what went well for you this week, what didn't go well for this week, and what might you do to improve your understanding for next week. And yeah, so with those students who were doing the reflection, they attempted more homework problems so that they actually did the practice quiz for one and they actually tried it a couple times and that came through with their posts. Um, the students who were doing the reflections viewed other students' reflections more because they were in the space. So that, that could help there. The, this course, I had them do an initial assessment. And so it wasn't just the students who were already doing well, chose to engage and, and then did well at the end. The improvement from initial assessment was mostly mar was marked more from students who chose to do the reflections. And so looking at where they were to start, it wasn't just the students who came in with a higher knowledge and just sort of ticked the boxes and finished their math course who ended up doing well throughout the course. There were some students that came in that didn't have a really great grasp and who chose to took part of this program that did show a, a large improvement from their initial assessment. And then also just the general course overall were, um, those again who chose, of course, that I, there was a, a bit of a great incentive point there that could be considered. But just looking through the numbers, um, of course, there's students who choose not to engage at all in anything, and you'd expect them to have a lower grade. But there were some students who did do well, but didn't do any of the reflections, but they didn't really improve and they didn't really engage. And well, they went and got their credit, and that that's fine too. Maybe they already um, have a system that works for them, and that that is great for me to uh, respect that. And that, that's one thing with self-regulated learning is I like to offer choice. I have a question here about it being superficial reflection um, and how I dealt with this. So I, I left it fairly open for students to, to, to take what they were doing. It took them some practice to to think more about just, I liked working with fractions or I didn't like working with fractions. And I would try and give them feedback, having them think about like, why might you not like that? Or what did you do to, so I found the, the conversation of feedback and the feedback was private to them in their grade book. I didn't do um, so that they could sort of take that per personally without being in the, say the, open reflection spot on either Flipgrid or a discussion forum. And I did find that the ones that stuck with it ended up talking more, more about what they were doing and how they were thinking as opposed to just, I don't like this topic or I don't like that topic as it went in. But it did take some modeling and it did take some encouragement. Um, it, 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 was a, it was a skill in itself. So if I were to do this again, which I'm planning to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm thinking about putting together a little bit better of a sort of a, a pre 
preview of here's some things to consider, here's what's going to be beneficial. Because um, not that I just threw them in with nothing, but I think I, I did my one example, but I think it would be better as well to have a bit more of that conversation about what makes a better, not that <laughs> reflections are not as good, but what type of um, more deeper reflections are going to be beneficial to them. So that's something that I'm hoping to do a little bit more of. Any other questions with um, this initiative, just adding in weekly reflections? Before I move on to another thing that I tried. was the marketing owners. I didn't find it to be, um, of course, when it was the weeks with video, and this was questions that I've gotten before, and I'll be talking about my video stuff in a minute. It does take a little bit longer to listen through. Um, so it, it does take a bit longer, obviously, than just a, something that's marked. Um, what I found is it did give me the chance to know my students a little bit better, especially if this one was online. And I sort of expected to see some parts. So as I got to know that relationship a little bit better, it, it helped, but it does take a bit of time. It is something that does take time. And that's something that I also would consider moving forward. Uh, the point with the next one I'm gonna talk about is the idea of, um, peer evaluation or peer feedback is something that I'm looking into because I'm not the only one who has beneficial information about learning. And so students can learn a lot from each other. And there was a bit of that conversation going on already. So that could be something if I'm looking for students to get feedback, but also get credit, I could make it more to me just checking that it was done and having students then um, give feedback back and forth to support their learning is something that I'm thinking about because yeah, it, it takes more time than just a check mark. And like I mentioned, this was something that I tried um, online with a group doing upgrading. I have tried reflections before as well with my policing students. And this was a hybrid course before 2020, and that was a pass-fail course where students had to demonstrate learning skills for a, it was a hiring skills, because up until, I think it was the beginning of 2020, there was a more intensive math portion for police hiring, so this was something that students would get really freaked out about, and so part of their hiring skills course, along with putting together their resume and interviewing skills, is we'd get them math skills, and with that course, a lot of what I focused on was helping students realize that I can learn this, and so their whole mark came from their ability to reflect and think about what don't I know? How am I going to get better at that? And they thought it was, first, they didn't believe me that they were just getting marked on whether or not they reflected and tried things. But it was amazing to see the change in perspective. And this is something that I'm not quite sure if I might be able to do in my core math classes. And that class has since changed. But the idea of showing students that how you engage with the material and um, how you think about your own plan with math can really give you that ability to learn it better. And uh, I'm hoping to try to do something like that again. Yeah, thank you, Emily. That's a great, great quote. And that would be something that would be great to share with students. Um, I like especially that those experiences in teaching others are what comes into play. And I've had students talk about this. I'm gonna to get to that in a moment, but having them realize the power of what they can do and what level they get can help them realize, oh, I do have some control over this and there are ways that I can get better at, um, well, learning how I learn and learning anything really. I think, thank you for that. 
All right. So the other thing that I tried, and if you came to my session in October, I, I'm going to be talking a little bit about this again, but for those of you maybe who weren't here, um, the other strategies that I was using previously with reflections and entry are sort of that learning schools and learning schools, learning skills and thinking skills um, being placed into the class. But I wanted something a little bit more, not intensive, but I wanted to think about uh, that actual critical thinking or getting students to think about their thinking directly within the concept of math. So not just about like how they're approaching their learning or how they're reflecting on what they're doing. I, I wanted like a, an actual skill-based thing to do. And one learning strategy that I found was the idea of a think aloud. So uh, the idea of a think aloud is instead of just writing out your response to something is verbally could be with yourself, could be in a group, uh, talking through how you're approaching the question. So reading the question out loud and then saying, well, what do I need to learn? Or what do I need to know? What do I already see? Well, when I look at this, I think that's so, sort of like a, a, a verbal run through of what you're thinking as you're thinking it in a could be a conversation with yourself style flow. And through looking through some research, I found that there were some great examples of this being used in person to help students who weren't, didn't have confidence with math to approach harder questions because it gave them a way to tackle and approach the question instead of just, here's the problem, go. Um, I also found, got some feedback from uh, learning support specialists in our student support centers talking about how with being online some students were really struggling because they were by themselves and they didn't have somebody to talk through the problem with because that's something that happens naturally in class or when we get into groups and so this was something with the shift online that I thought might be interesting to get students actually talking and, and communicating their learning as opposed to just writing it down. So what I did here is I added think alouds to my weekly in process. So normally, um, normally, we don't have normal anymore. Uh, we'd have weekly tutorials where students in groups would work through an application activity and then submit their work and be done with it. So they'd, they'd talk in the groups and then I'd get the paper artifact of what they've done and then they'd move on with their week. But with moving online, I'm like, well, I. I could get them to do breakout rooms, but who knows what happens in the breakout rooms. And I wanted to make sure that all of the students were gaining a familiarity and an ability to work with a, an application problem and work through those more in-depth um, problem types. So what I did is during those tutorials, I would model thinking aloud through a problem. So I'd have some examples and as a class, I would I would model, okay, well, what would we do here? And if I look at this, I think about this here. I get to this part and I'm not quite sure how to approach it. Did I talk about this earlier? And sort of talking through my thoughts as I'm approaching a question for the class to, for them to see sort of an example of what I mentally go through while working through a question. And I do that every tutorial. And then after we worked through some examples. I, I modeled, well, I was teaching, so I was talking anyway, but more focusing on talking about how I knew what to do something or how I could figure out what to do. Then I did have students go into breakout groups. And in that group, I would either assign them a question or I found it better to pre-provide a list of questions and they could choose whatever one as a group from that list. Some students ended up choosing a different one than their group worked through. And that just gave them some choice to some students again in the groups didn't really wanna speak up and that was fine. But from that list of questions, they would as a, as a group talk through, okay, how could we approach this? And so they'd model that idea of, of talking through in their group. And it was great to sort of see and hear them using the similar language to what I was modeling in class as they walked through um, those problems. And then because in the breakout rooms, you can't entirely know what's going on in all of them. And uh, I wanted to make sure that all the students were, again, 
understanding and realizing what was going on, I had the students submit a video of themselves working through the problem orally. So it didn't have to show their face if they weren't comfortable. That was fine, but um, it could be like a screen capture. Some of them had tablets and sort of wrote out what they were doing. Some of them turned their phone around and sort of talked through their work or live walked through their work as they were going and basically explaining how to approach that type of question and how they knew what to do. And this was a great um, opportunity for students because like that quote there about how they were able to realize if I sort of take on the role or change my communication to helping somebody else understand this question, it helped them um, think about the different questions others might have. And uh, when the, those questions were submitted, then in, uh, in the platform, it had the ability for there to be peer review. So I set up a rubric for things for students to look for, and they were able to give form enough feedback and also um, feedback on the students. So some students would find, oh, be careful, you, you did this here when you should have done that. And so there was a, an ability to do um, back and forth conversation in the feedback portal. No students chose to do video feedback, but they could have, uh, that option was there. Uh, and generally, one thing that I didn't do as much, but I would do moving forward is give a little bit more information on what makes good feedback and um, what makes, uh, yeah, feedback both constructive and also useful. And that's something that I'm looking more into because our tools have switched. And I am just got a question about class sizes. So my class sizes for this group was around 60. And for, in general, my classes are around yeah, 30 to 60 in size. And I agree definitely with the differentiation. Um, what I was worried about with this procedure is I wanted to give students sort of a couple options so they'd feel comfortable, but I did want them to practice talking out loud. So by giving them options on which question to choose, it gave them some control over what they were doing, but also with how they chose to do their video. Um, some of them never showed their face and until this semester, I never knew what they, who, who they were visually. Um, and some I had a couple like set up a whole lesson where they had things taped to their um, wall and they would run through and they would pull papers away and walk through. So it was really interesting to see their creativity that way as well. Some of them just had a script and walked through. So, uh, but it, it was what they were comfortable with and what they were able to do. But what I really, again, with the, the feedback piece is they were able then to see what other students were doing um, and, I found that they, at least they commented that they would learn from that experience as well, where somebody had uh, been able to demonstrate <laughs> what was being done. And then they're like, oh, I hadn't thought about doing it that way. And I like to encourage in my class that there's no one way for a lot of these things. If you think about it that way, if you can explain it, then that's great. And that really helps students realize, okay, I can explain this and it doesn't have to be a direct uh, quote of what Heather was doing in class. One thing with the peer review. So my, my learning management system just changed <laughs> what video provider we have. And so right now I'm looking into setting up Peer Scholar. I don't know, has anybody worked with Peer Scholar before? It's developed by University of Toronto. while you're thinking about that, a uh, question about concerns with privacy and sharing of videos. So it was a tool that was directly inside the learning management system. And so those videos couldn't be downloaded as it was. And um, so I think that did help for some students who did have that concern. I told them you could, um, turn your camera around and just do your work. I did have one student who really wasn't comfortable and they ended up just doing a live talk through with me individually. They didn't get the peer feedback piece, but I did want to respect their 
their privacy concerns. Uh, they didn't want other people hearing them and, and that was okay with me. And so I, I did set up that one student, they did do an individual one-on-one um, -on -one with me. And that's something to consider as well. Like I, in our school, we get the access plans and there's certain considerations there as well. But I have found for some of my students, um, they almost request to talk through more things than write through other things. So it, it was a nice sort of change on being able to represent their math in a different way. Yeah, we had Bongo, uh, but now we've, we've switched. And yeah, for elementary school teachers, I, I, I'm in a program right, right now with a lot of um, early educators, and it's really great to see some of the different things that are coming up in educational psychology. And it's, I find a great spot for inspiration. Um, I'm in a course right now with a lot of kindergarten teachers and some of the discovery learning practices that are there are just amazing. Yeah, but I'm not seeing a lot of, if you haven't heard of Peer Scholar, I haven't fully implemented yet. I'm sort of working on a, a trial right now, but it's a platform that's developed for helping for um, three phases of feedback and allowing students to peer assess each other. Generally, the main, main sort of case to start with was a setting up a document or doing a group project, but it does allow for video as well. So that's why I've been this is me thinking ahead to my fall semester. But um, the nice thing within the product is they've pre-built learning modules in there about what makes good feedback and how to, not just what makes good feedback, but how to accept feedback. Because that's something to consider as well as some students might think, oh, I don't want to say anything negative because that could hurt students' feelings or sort of preparing them for what's the purpose of feedback, how to take feedback and how to realize what is good feedback. And that's actually built into the peer scholar tool in, in the stages. So I'm looking into that and maybe I'll, I'll share more about that once I, I, I learn a bit more. But what's interesting with that tool is it does allow the chance for the peer feedback to be anonymous. Granted, if it was video, then it, then it changes because well you can you can see people so I'm going to consider maybe having students choose what format they want to present themselves in and then the neat thing with that tool is it allows students to also assess the feedback so was this feedback helpful for me um, and so it's not just a free reign for students to give feedback one way but you can give feedback the other way on how that feedback was helpful or not. And again, the rubrics and the style of questions or the questionnaires for um, the students can be customized and built in the instructor platform. So I did for this weekly in process, I did it every week except for testing weeks so that I had three testing weeks so, and it wasn't the first week. <laughs> so mental math in my head, it ended up being 10 weeks of think alouds. And again, consideration with grading, watching the videos does take time. And so that's why, again, I'm, I'm looking to shift a bit more into having peer assessment as a strategy, because not just saving my time, but it does add for a richer experience for students. I'm not, again, the only one who can support students learning and like being able to learn something better, you learn better by teaching. Well, if students can learn to give better feedback and improve from feedback by being the teacher in that setting. Uh, so that's that's my next goal is to take a little bit off of my my docket. Not that I wouldn't watch watch them still, but then the the depth of the feedback could I could share that load a, a bit with the peers. But yeah, I did uh, 10 weeks. So it was it became a routine for students. And pretty good buy-in. The students who did it, did it. There were some who, who chose not to, and it wasn't a, a crippling level of their mark that they could choose not to do it. But I actually included in that course as part of their testing, their long answer, they had to either orally or video walk through and explain how they'd come to their work sort of as a explanation and a backup. Again, this was me thinking, being online, how can I make sure my students are doing this and actually understanding it? 
So the weekly um, walkthroughs were a part of their weekly in process, which was 1% per week, but it was only a quarter of that. So it was only like 0.25% <laughs> it was these activities. So it wasn't a large amount. Um, and again, it, it gave them that choice of whether or not they wanted to engage without it being crippling, but it gave enough incentive to some students to try something new that they might not have. So yeah, about a quarter of a percent every week. On the test, it was more, yeah. What helps though with, again, for perspective, I, I recognize with some different groups, like this was with a group who are highly motivated. It's in a course similar to pre-health, but for um, emergency services, but a lot of the students want to get into paramedicine. So our paramedic program has a really high average cutoff. So these students are very highly motivated to get high grades because currently I believe it's like 97% average or something to get into the paramedic program at our school. And so the that specific group is fairly highly motivated by those small opportunities to both learn and improve. And from the program ourselves, but also from their destination program, there's a big focus on you need to be able to express yourself and you need to be able to um, manage your time and be in control of your learning. So it helps that they get a messaging of that, not just in one spot, but also from their sort of program destination of choice, that building these skills is going to be beneficial. And that's something that I bring up in class as well, in that emergency services field, talking about, okay, you, you are going to be in the field talking with people, you need to be able to explain what you're doing. Imagine a paramedic comes up to you and then doesn't want to, uh, doesn't know what you're doing. You need to explain what you're doing. Um, what tool, so I, I was using the Bongo video assignment tool and then our college stopped supporting that tool. So I'm hoping to switch that next year. We just stopped supporting it in December. And then I'm hoping to switch to Peer Scholar um, because again, for that ability to do the peer feedback piece, with the discussion boards, I've tried to do a bit of discussion boards, but the students um, were less, <laughs> less engaged with uploading their content without having the direct um, video in there. Some were still able to do it, but um, I found it a bit harder. So having an integrated tool definitely does help. And so that's something that I'm looking about how I might do, because I'm going to be in person, but I'm trying to figure out a nice way of, of incorporating them both. But the video assignment tool was, was a great tool when I had it available. So if you have it, definitely recommend checking it out. Yeah, and the academic integrity piece was something that I was one of my actual rationales for starting it is because I'm like, how am I going to know if these students actually get it? And there was there was a couple of students who in their talk through, it was clear they had no clue what they were talking about. And somebody who knows who had helped them write out their notes, because as they were talking through, they didn't they didn't know. And so it was actually a great opportunity for me to then reach out and be like, it seems like you don't really know what's going on here. Let's talk about this or how you might get that. And it gave me an opportunity to to sort of nicely come aside and say, you don't actually seem to know what's going on here. It's great that you've gotten help to put together your work. Um, and, then, uh, and then it started those conversations. Yeah, for those students who had no clue, it, I feedback, but also I, I reached out um, via email suggested setting up an appointment. So I do video office hours. And so we set up an appointment and walked through. And sometimes these students don't know how to ask for help and they think they have to know everything. So just saying like, it's okay. It seems like you have a bit of confusion here. Let's set up an appointment. Let's work through this and um, figure out what you don't know here. So it gave, gave me a good opportunity to, to realize those spots, especially being online, because it would have been easy for them to hide that knowledge if I hadn't been able to hear that they really don't know what they're talking about. And so the 
past semester, I got some qualitative, I, I asked students to give me a bit of feedback about how they felt about expressing them orally and talking through the questions as opposed to writing them down. And I had a, a, a wide array of how students felt, but in general, most of them appreciated the opportunity to express themselves in different ways. You can see the, the one student over here is like, well, math should be written and math is best to write on paper. And I, 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 can, I can empathize with that. But um, I, I liked seeing how they did mention how they recognize when talking about real life problems, they need to be able to communicate with their peers. And so it was encouraging for me to see that coming back from them because I introduced these activities with the reason that I'm getting you to talk through these. One supports your thinking and your ability to learn, but also it's going to support you being able to communicate in your with your partner. So a lot of these jobs are are partner based, but also with um, the people you're serving in the community, you, you need to be able to communicate what you're talking about. Uh, in paramedicine as well, they end up in labs and they have to be able to work in a small team and describe what they're doing or um, explain their reasoning. And so students appreciate having that relevancy. Of, oh, that's why I'm doing this. Um, I try to bring in some of the competencies from their labs, from the para paramedic program, so they can see like, these are some of the things you're gonna be grading on. And that's why we're practicing these so that you have that base. And I had a, one student um, talk with me. He's like, I've never really, wanted or appreciated doing anything with math but now that I see like I can actually just through the way I communicate and these skills have those actual applications it's now really exciting for me to do so it's always nice to hear those things and from the people I don't always expect uh, looking at some of this other feedback uh, I had the one student on the left here about using body language and physical expression this student um had told me previously how they really struggled to show their work and they really appreciated the opportunity to talk through things and by doing these video assignments it gave them a, a way to express things differently uh, or use like physical tools to explain what they are doing as opposed to just having to write things out um, the student on the bottom here mentions that part of, I believe the best way to remember something is to teach someone. So this is a student who has realized that you remember something that you teach. And uh, they they came out with this themselves. And so they're realizing that and, and their, their work is always focused on making things really clear. So it, it's great to see that understanding um, being tied in the background there. And even my students who struggle, uh, the comment on the bottom here, I'm not the greatest at math. So talking through my problems definitely helps me break it down. And this was a, this was a student that who really would never say anything in class, be it online or is in this group. And uh, so we ended up, we're now in person, but now they've gotten the confidence to break things down. So they'll email me about a part of what they're working for, or they'll ask me later about a part of what they are doing. And so it's given them the confidence to break things down instead of having to look at something as one large problem that you have to do. And so it, it's been encouraging. And then I'm hoping to do a little bit, it's, it's I don't, frustrating is hard of a word that my, my technology backend is changing, but I'm, I'm hoping to do a little bit more um, work with this online, with things changing with being in person and online, it gives me some other things to consider, but definitely um, an initiative that I've really appreciated. And I feel my students have also um, appreciated from at least what they're telling me. It did have a bit of that learning curve, but I think by, again, my messaging of how it's important and why it's great and just, getting that ability to converse um, led to some really, really great results. Any other questions about um, the think aloud strategy?
Yeah, one way I've been extending this uh, this semester with being back in person is again, thinking lab wise is doing oral check-ins so they can choose. So again, giving a little bit more choice to do their application problem orally with me, or they can video it, or they can do it on paper, um, or they can sort of like map it out with other um, sort of representations. So it's giving them that choice. And there's been a few who choose to just like, I'm gonna do it now, ask me the question and I'll talk it through with you. So it's great seeing that build of confidence. And again, it's preparing them for those lab skills. So in like the healthcare setting, I think it's definitely something that's interesting to think about uh, preparing them for lab and for bell ringer style activities. Did they complain about how much time it takes and with assignments? So for this one, they have three units and then three unit assignments. The assignments were available to them for the entirety of the unit. And then each week there was this activity to do and there was the, um, I have weekly homework check-ins which are through, um, the D2L quiz tool for, I didn't have any students explicitly mention that it takes too long. Um, at least not that I heard, who knows what they were saying to each other, but no one said that directly. What I think helped is they weren't on their own to start thinking about the question. It wasn't like a new added on assignment. We always had at least 15 minutes in our tutorial for them and their groups to talk through the question they were going to do. And they were able to use that exact same question for their video assignment. So they could have already practiced it in their group, what they were going to say or talked through. And so it gives them sort of that um, pre-assurance, okay, I'm, I'm doing this right, or I have, um, I, I know what I'm doing. So I didn't add on an additional question. It wasn't something new. It was one that they have already had the chance to talk about in class. And some of them actually, because it was online, would talk in their groups and then do the video assignment right then, which is was sort of my hope is that it wouldn't take too much time outside. They would just take it within class. <laughs> Thank you for that perspective. I, I like to think that. Um, I tend to be a, uh, a hap, <laughs> happy math person. And so I always wonder if I am, because with my, my positive face here, they're like, oh, we don't want to say anything negative to Heather. But uh, <laughs> who knows? I do ask for a lot of feedback. And so I imagine it, it might come out. But it, I'd be open to hearing about it. But I try to think about that when I'm putting together the tools. Is, I know for me, I want to make sure that they're using their time on things that are going to be beneficial to you, to them. So then I, I try to tell them that as well. Yeah, and for um, doing with students in a tutorial setting, that one of my references on my final page is from a group who worked with at-risk students in a middle school setting, um, but how they were able to use that to, to support their learning. So definitely something that I have found for all levels of my students to be helpful. All right, so that's what I've tried and a little bit about that idea of, of thinking about learning and learning how to learn. And again, a lot of what I might be talking about next, you might be already doing some of this and you might just not be calling it uh, teaching your students how to learn. And I find what's nice is, um, is having some ideas and having some things to do that doesn't have to entirely rework your curriculum that you can add in sort of as a value add. Uh, so a question here about the evaluation scheme for the Think Aloud videos. Yeah, so I had them as part of my weekly in process. So I have a professionalism rubric that students are marked on every week. And so part of that in process was doing the regular activities. So that was 25% of their weekly in process and the weekly in process, they get 1% a week for being 
what I call professional students is what I tell them. So you get 1% a week for being a good student and a quarter of that came from doing that think aloud. So it was a very, very small part of the actual evaluation. But again, what I tried to tell them is that it's going to help them in their learning. So I didn't want to make it so that it's a very large weighted um, activity. I, I wanted them to realize that this is beneficial to your learning because I find, again, I didn't want to make it so I, it was that reward. You're only doing this for marks. I tried to frame it more. This is going to be a really great benefit to you as a student. And yeah, I agree. Just don't tell them. <laughs> It's 25% of the weekly grade. They, they hear the big numbers, not the small ones. Um, yeah, and so uh, adaptations for students with uh, disability. I had one student who did not want to talk at all, and they ended up doing um, a video. You might have seen that where they hold up a piece of paper with what they'd say and then just flipped through. So they didn't want to talk. I'm like, okay, we can work with this. And then they ended up um, using the, just their, their statements written out on pages and they just cycled through them on the video. And the Bongo tool in the video assignment does have a captioning tool in there to help with um, students who do have any auditory disability in that sense. And they did have a choice um, because it's worth so small of the marks. I'm sure student, certain students might be able to figure out that it's not worth that much. And of course, students are making decisions all the time of whether or not it's worth their time to do <laughs> certain activities. And this wasn't a test or this wasn't um, a, a large assignment. So there were some who didn't participate. In general, week to week, I had about 75% of the class would do the activities. And um, yeah, 25% chose not to, and, and that's their choice. Uh, just like students can choose not to do assignments and not do homework. But again, I tried to sell it in a sense of this is gonna help you. And then I did include a similar activity as part of their formal final assessment. So I was saying, well, you're studying for your test by doing this, it's giving you an ability to try. And this um, for class size was 60 students. I like that, Laura, about uh, time now to save time for later. You're making a deposit in the uh, time bank. A different grading scheme for the students who weren't able to speak aloud. No, they had the same one. Again, a lot of my, because this was an in-process activity, my grades for them were actually entirely, did they do it or did they not? So if they did it, if they tried, if they tried putting something out there, they got that full 0.25% for that week. Um, the actual feedback part came from the peer assessment on the rubric. So if they lost points on that rubric or if they did something wrong, they actually didn't lose any marks. They just had an opportunity there to um, realize that's what they would like to work on or things that they'd need to consider. Would I increase the percentage? See, there, there's the thing of it, yes, it took a lot of my time, but I don't know, I really like having a lot of opportunities for that formative assessment piece and giving them a spot for trying things out that's a safe environment that isn't going to be crippling for their grade. So because I was looking to give them that opportunity to build this skill in a safe environment, I'm already making it scary by making them share their voice and their face. I, I liked having it be fairly low grade wise so that it, it took away a little bit of that risk because um, it already had some inherent riskiness and in that, oh, people will hear me or potentially see me. So I, I liked removing a bit of that grading risk of just saying, hey, as long as you do it, you're gonna get full credit and you're gonna be making yourself a more equipped learner and you're going to be allowing yourself to develop communication skills that will serve you in the future. So it was really, I tried to phrase it as a full, it's value add, it's just not <laughs> grade final ads, but you'll get um, more learning skills that can help with your grades through doing it. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's been fun. Uh, but yeah, it, I, I definitely 
when when I talk about it, there is that that piece of a lot of work for grading. And I know in our current climate too, it's like, oh, where 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 is the time? And so I am looking to see better ways that I can bring in um, ideas for for peer evaluation and for getting sort of <laughs> help uh, making sure students still get the feedback, but also that it's not always on, on me. So hopefully having you think a little bit about some possible ideas, uh, I have some strategies or things you might consider. Maybe it might be a bit much to add in weekly videos to have your students to do or weekly reflections, but some a, a lot of ideas can be some lower effort ways to at least get the idea of thinking about thinking, thinking about learning for your students. And again, math class could be the great spot for it. Totally, Rebecca, I am the same. I have in my one class, I teach typing skills and uh, it's me just sort of checking whether or not they've done something. And I <laughs> copy paste copy paste and they always give such great feedback and I'm like you're getting the same as a lot of your peers but I think it's it's important for students to to get something um because then they 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 feel like they've been seen and I think I think that is an important important part to note especially with having been online I remember I with exit tickets when we were in person I would have them hand in a piece of paper and I'd just put a simple like excellent or this was great or good idea here and I had a couple of students tell me that they really just appreciated having that happy word with an exclamation point in purple I don't know why I always use purple and uh it just they had a sheet they'd hand back and forth with me for their exit tickets and just having that little bit of positive feedback takes a I guess a little bit to write it all down but uh uh I again hearing that feedback from students helped me realize how important my feedback can be to them as well. That's a good question, Natalia. Um, and this is why I'm hoping to look a little bit more into Peer Scholar and I will report back, but I believe they have some like preset ideals in there. So it, definitely something worth considering because I, I know for my student, group having examples or having something to work from is 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 a great idea because it gives them that starting spot because it could be a blank page is is always very intimidating all right so i like that rebecca yeah having prompts and that i wonder prompt is actually part of one of these pre-learning tools <laughs> on on this screen so a lot of the ideas with self-regulated learning is equipping students with learning tools that they can sort of create a tool set with, as well as develop their um, own personal preferences for work, what works for them and different things that they can try. So a lot of these, again, seem fairly straightforward, but like for me, I was reading that students don't realize that they should practice remembering things. <laughs> sometimes students don't know that some of these things can be beneficial to them. So in some of the self-regulated learning discussions, they mention modeling a tool and then using it in class as a way of showing students, this is a way that you can do it. Having a discussion about, hey, if you learn about how you learn, it's going to benefit you across different classes. Yeah, they, they come with their own predispositions for learning. And I've read a few instructors who will start um, their course, regardless of the topic, on giving them a article on growth mindset of the idea of um, realizing that I don't know this yet, but I can work at this and, and learn it. So getting that in the language from day one. So some of these tools here, um, the idea is that cycle. So pre-learning tools, so things you can do before class. This ties in with like those entry ticket type of ideas, talking about um, what is expected for me from this class. What do I already know that I wonder, that predicting and wondering? So what questions do I have? Um, at the end of this course, what do I think I should be able to do? Um, the reason for learning. This one's I find is great. And in a lot of our templates for our online, we've been encouraged to include that idea of a hook or tying it into something that's happening, but getting students to think about like, why might I need to learn about 
logarithms. <laughs> why, why is this useful to me? But having them think about it before we, we fill that, that space so that they get used to that, that struggle of thought of not knowing the answer and coming up with ideas. So these are great ways that you can prompt students. Um, how will this improve my ability to do my job in this program? For on the task tools, so this is just explicitly modeling different ways that students can potentially write their notes if we're talking about in class. So highlighting while you are doing your class important features, they might want to highlight talking through um, how you might visualize or organize your information. So you have related things, tying things back to other points. And then, um, having understanding checks stopping for a moment do i understand what's going on right now reading back did i understand what i just wrote down and then also troubleshooting like do i some tools here is having students stop and think i'm like if i don't get this where can i go for resources i tend to tell my students every time when i ask questions at the beginning and at the end and if you're not comfortable asking questions right now remember it takes practice being able to ask for help. You can set up an appointment. We have a um, peer tutoring network. We have a student support uh, tutors. And YouTube is a great <laughs> strategy as well for students who want to uh, find things out on their own. And then um, confirmation of learning tasks. So encouraging students to write a summary or maybe create a headline or a map. Metacognition is an interesting one. So posing questions to about thinking about thinking and how they're learning. So am I learning this? How confident do I feel on this topic? Um, how can I improve my learning? So getting actually putting those questions in there. Some textbooks have um, great resources as well at the end of chapters for doing that self-check but encouraging students to, to do those tools or pointing them to that those tools exist. I've had students not realize they had a textbook, of course, and that the textbook has a lot of these worked into them because, well, they're important learning tools, but just drawing their attention to um, those tools that exist there. And then also just tying in opportunities for reflection, having prompts or encouraging students to include this as part of their learning. What worked well? What didn't go well? How can I improve? What resources do I have? Again, by getting them to recall this information, to put it to paper or to text or put it even in their head, it gets them thinking about, um, it gives awareness to where they are at in, in their learning process. So that's just in general. These are things that can be prompted or modeled uh, and encouraged. On my reference slide on the bottom, I have a link to a site that has a whole bunch of different thinking and learning game strategies, ideas. Uh, the Think Aloud I ended up getting from there. And uh, so if you're looking for some more concrete examples of things to try, there's some other ones in there. And I'm going to highlight just a couple here as well that I found have been ways that you can sort of start thinking about adding in some learning about learning in your class. So some low effort additions. So without reworking a lot and just giving a bit of space, uh, pausing and doing think pair shares is a great way to encourage student uh, metacognition recall and having them realize whether or not they understand something. The pausing is an important thing here. We talk think pair share, but the pause is also, I find it's easy in a in a lesson, and here I do it here, here right now, is just to keep on going and wanting to fill the space. But it, it takes time sometimes to think and be like, do I, do I understand what's happening here? So having a pause and some time to think, having students pair up, discuss do, what's going on right now, or what do you think about this problem, or what ideas do you have about what we're talking about here, and then sharing it as a group. And an interesting thing with the share is um, you could have like typical in-class sharing. Uh, you could also use technology tools. So 
we did that Mentimeter at the beginning, and that's a nice anonymous way of sharing. I have some peers who use an anonymous Google Doc that's going the entire time of class, be it in person or online, and students can just put comments or questions in that Google Doc that is, it's anonymous and it's a safe spot to share without students, some of them don't want to put themselves out there, but it gives them that safe way to engage. Uh, just like with being online and having a private mes message option has been helpful. Um, yeah, I have a couple links on my on my last slide and readings. And um, I find a lot of them don't always have the math tie-in. <laughs> and so that that takes a little bit of a little bit of um, creativity, but the last link on my final slide, which will be shared, has a whole site of different thinking strategies that um, can be modeled and used in class. So another low effort is just using graphic organizers. So that could be mind maps, that could be showing connections to things on your slides, including graphics and uh, data in a way that has a visual representation, because that creates better linkages and easier recall. And so instead of just having a list of things showing how they're connected, using your smart art, if you're using PowerPoint to show cycles uh, and connections as well, can help with recall and also helps to model students Maybe if you're doing a review instead of just um, going through the topics is maybe developing a mind map as a group and discussing how different topics are connected and where we go or the strategies for uh, approaching a different question. Say we're working on a certain type of problem set. So here's the question, what and how is it related? Instead of just listing out your algorithm, making it more of a web. And that can be helpful for students for making those connections and realizing, oh, when I do this conversion over here, this unit analysis method helps me with these type of questions, just showing it in a more graphical sense. Um, retrieval practice is another one. Um, so before we're done with a topic, closing our notes and having students practice, how much do I actually remember? Am I able to recall anything that we've talked about? You could prompt specific questions or you could just say, well, what did you learn today? And having them realize how much they do remember or don't remember and then encourage them to think about, now look back over your notes and what things didn't you recall? What things are you gonna to want to review and then practice recalling on? You could also do this with um, specific question types within math class, have them close their nights. I like to do you tries. So close your notes, here's a question, how do we do it? And getting them practicing, not having their notes to work from. Because again, a lot of students will say in class, I'm able to do this really easily. And then when I get home, I don't know how to do my homework at all. So giving them a sort of simulated testing environment or simulated, you don't have help environment to, for them to realize what do I know and what don't I know so they can get that practice. And again, having that not be like a formal quiz, but just being something in class for them to practice that retrieval. Do I know how to do this now? And students who don't, well, giving them then um, an opportunity to ask about, okay, these are things you can now do. Another one that I've been working with a little bit, I've seen called test wrappers, um, but basically it's an idea of, wrapping a test or assessment within reflection. So either as part of the test, or I like having it be after as a separate activity, so it's not fueled by the, I need to get this done within the question sets of the test. Um, ask students how the test went, how prepared they felt, um, what they did to prepare. So having them actually document their process for how they prepare for a test or an exam. And then when they get it back, have a second part. So this is sort of that wrapping part of what, how did that match up to how they felt? So is there, um, are they, were they right <laughs> in how they felt? Were there things that they missed? Were there um, different ways that now, now knowing this, what could I do to maybe prepare better? 
what things did I miss? Or maybe everything went well, so I should make sure to remember that I did this, this, and this, and that'll help me in the future. So looking at both sides, and then also have some form of discussion. Students generally, I find, might not want to share everything, but um, using some anonymous ways of getting students to share is up there, but just talking about general strategies, having polls. What did you do? Did that work for you? Uh, if, we're, if we're talking stats, uh, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll bring in a couple of graphs of students who did their homework more than once, had this happen, and just what do you think about that and getting students to think about um, what they're doing and how it relates to their testing results. I've used these in the past with uh, one group with sort of unlocking a uh, correction opportunity. So if you're if you're willing and wanting to reflect on your process, then you can also have the opportunity to submit some corrections with a portion being able to be credited back. That's in my less competitive programs where it's more focused on sort of that mastery learning. So it gives that chance for revision. And so students are like, well, can't I just send you my corrections? I'm like, no, part of this is if you're going to be able to revise, you need to reflect on what happened. So I, I include that as sort of do this reflection, talk through, talk about what went well and what you'd want to do. And then, uh, and then now here's your chance to make some corrections for this one and then use both of that to move forward to the next assessment. Yeah, I, I find it's, it's interesting to see too, because not all students will take you up on it. And again, it's giving them their choice. Uh, giving them their opportunity to choose their own learning path. And I mentioned this back in October, but I thought it's worth coming up again is how you present yourself as part of the learning environment is really important for setting up an environment for these type of learning skills. So instead of it just as a, a work ad <laughs> for your students, modeling with yourself the importance of these type of skills. So if I'm doing a style of learning activity or with those think alouds, for example, instead of just saying, now you do this, I would try absolutely everything myself and I would document my trials. So I would do a recording of me doing the example. I would post that uh, final result. I would also include different how-tos or strategies, or if you aren't quite sure, how to do this examples are, I found are really important and useful for students to sort of base what that level that I'm looking for and how they might approach it instead of just a blank uh, page. One thing I've been working with and I think I'm okay with it is I just, I keep all my mistakes. I always just record once and uh, I never <laughs> quite, quite view back all of it. But the nice thing with keeping my mistakes is that I'll live think aloud my problems. So sometimes when I'm doing a run through, I forget to do something. I'm like, oh, I forgot to do this. I know that because this has happened here. Well, to fix this, I'm going to have to do this. So come along with me and let's fix that. And um, it shows that, hey, everybody makes mistakes and it's okay to get a bit flustered, but now we'll deal with it. And then now we've, we've gotten through. So I always would keep any of my mistakes in my videos. Uh, it's a little bit putting yourself out there, but I, it helped with that authenticity. Um, so students saw, Hey, I'm a person just like I make mistakes in class. And I, I have been working to ask for help from my students which is an interesting strategy that's taken a lot for me to do because it's like, oh, that's admitting I don't know things. But if I forget something in class or if I'm not quite sure, I'm like, oh, I don't know this right now. Can anybody look this up or help me out? And it's sometimes basic things, but it shows that I realize that I have to ask for help and it really creates a good environment that it's okay to not know. It's okay to not know everything. We, we all don't know everything. So having that bit of vulnerability though tough, I, it's very tough, uh, can really great, create a great spot for students to also be willing to enter into that vulnerability with you. Language modeling is a big one. Uh, so the language you use, especially if you're looking for specific words, are going to be important to model. So asking the why, not just going through the example, we do this, we do this, we do this, but pausing having those pauses. How do I know this? Why might I want to do it a different way? 
I love that, Natalia. You're forgetting my calculator. And I always tell students when I make mistakes, I'm like, this is an actual mistake. I didn't plant this. <laughs> Sometimes I do do, here's, here's a mistake and let's see if we can fix it. But uh, it, it's, it's great to give some of the, the classroom control back. It's very easy for me to want to control everything, but realizing that sometimes some of the great learning opportunities is having that student input. What are you actually wondering about? What are you struggling with? Instead of just my ideas of what, what they're gonna be struggling with. And I find with group work and also language is just showing the different things that you can have and having prompts are really important because especially with being online, students have gotten to a point that a lot of things have been typed out. So getting used to certain words, getting used to saying certain things and asking certain questions, it takes practice. So modeling those as well. And one of the biggest is that explanation of why. So we're wondering about why we should do things all the time. And that's why I tried to start this with rationale, but it's the same for our students. They're in a program, they're in a course for a specific reason. So draw attention to that. I like to start my classes with a start with why activity. If you've read the book by Simon Sinek, but I, I encourage them to write down in their notebooks, why am I here? Why does my work here matter? Why does this course contribute to my success? And then I have them go back to that throughout the course as we go through. But while I'm doing activities, again, mentioning that learning is a process that you can learn how to get better at learning, how uh, communication is something that's going to benefit you, actually saying those things as opposed to just assuming that they're implied, but also the practical skills as well. Like when we're doing the math problems, instead of just uh, counting watermelons as much as possible, having those authentic examples in there, they're harder to put in place, but students really do appreciate them and explaining that that really helps them connect to that motivation piece as well. And the main thing that I encourage everyone to do is just creating an environment that is conducive to helping students learn about themselves and learning how to learn. Uh, these are things that probably are in a lot of your classrooms, but just here I'm recognizing your effort, but recognizing for yourself the type of things that can create an environment for students that are going to be conducive to them feeling comfortable and exploring their abilities. So that encouragement of questions. Uh, I have heard student feedback that sometimes in certain courses they don't have a spot to ask, or it can put it can be it can be scary <laughs> to put yourself out there and admit that you don't know. I've had some students say that they'd like now that we're back in class because they can hear other students' questions a little bit better and it, it helps them think. But like I mentioned with me asking for help in class, normalizing that it's okay to not know and just, I sound like a broken record when I do it, but every class just here's for appointments, here's our student services, here's the different ways you can get help. You might not know right now what you need help with, but that's okay, but make sure that you're checking in with these things. One other thing with self-regulated learning is the idea of goals. So having students think about like, what is your goal here? What, what might you want to achieve at the end of this class or at the sort of a, a right now goal or a more distal goal as well? Like what's your goal for this course? What things are you hoping to learn? Um, if you have students in an upgrading program, maybe they have a specific average they're looking for. So it's more numerical, but also just um, with communicating how this course can benefit them, having them sort of maybe they could make learning goals, like I'm going to um, incorporate a, a, a regular homework um, practice, or I'm going to do small bits of homework instead of waiting for the last minute. So getting them to think about how they're learning and making even like a learning process goal. And talk about your own goals and your own learning. So I'm currently trying to learn how to cook and I'm failing, but I, I mentioned that to my students in the early startups. These are the things that I've tried and this is what has not worked. And it, it shows again that process and that vulnerability as well. One thing is encouraging self-comparison. It's easy in the competitive programs for students to be like, what did you get? What did you get? What did you get? But in a lot of your wording and your feedback, focusing on telling students that you're improving. It's great to see how, where you were and where you're back. And I encourage students in the class to look back at their previous results or also, uh, I really celebrate those who are willing to try homework a couple times because I'm like, look, you are showing perseverance. You are showing resilience. Wasn't it satisfying when you finally got that one right? But actually 
drawing attention to it so students can realize, oh, I am, I am doing something. I'm taking action. And it's always hard to take action, but I'm taking action and it's, and it's having a result. And with that is recognizing effort in your feedback. I know in actual grading, we can't just say, oh, well, you tried so hard. Obviously, you, you know what you're doing here. But I had a student this past semester say that it was so encouraging to them for me to recognize that they were trying hard in my feedback, that nobody had ever said that before. They just started their feedback with, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, you need to, didn't do that. So that, that sandwich idea with feedback that you may have heard, but idea, but mentioning, like you, you tried really hard on this. I can see that you did a lot of attempts here and you've, you've finally gotten that control, that, that problem type, great work putting in the effort. Like starting with that, that celebration with students and showing them that you can see, like you are working at this and I really appreciate you engaging even when this is tough and it can really help change their perspective that, oh yeah, this is tough, but yeah, I am doing this. It, it changes that, that mental uh, voice in their head. So just some ideas, a lot of them, <laughs> some of them are a little bit more, uh, less concrete, I guess would be a way of saying it, but hopefully getting you to start thinking about ways that you might be able to bring in a little bit of learning how to learn and students' perception and ability to actually recognize what they're doing as a learner in your classroom. So on that note, if you don't have it open, I'm going to go, oops, I'm going to go back to our Mentimeter and I'm going to go to my next slide here. I've highlighted just a couple of things that I've talked about here. And if you go to the page, it brings up a ranking. Uh, just, you don't have to <laughs> rank all of them, but if there's one or two that you think you might uh, wanna try, feel free to select that from the list. And uh, just to see what you're thinking there, if there are things that might be useful for you or that you feel like might be something that you might wanna try. I encourage you to give a try. I found at first when I started talking about, oh, I'm going to be innovative in my curriculum. And uh, it, it, it sounds really daunting. But what I hope that maybe inspired a little bit is that small changes or adding in small places can really create a great environment for your students. And sometimes just your attitude or the way you present things can create a more inclusive and a more open learning environment for students to gain a bit more confidence. Thanks for those sharing a bit there. And I like that current first creating an encouraging environment. Even if, yeah, rewriting or adding in new activities can be a lot of work and I recognize we, we never need more work. Uh, just the general environment can be something that makes such a difference for our students. And on that note, um, yeah, I open up the floor here for any other questions or thoughts or things that you're wondering about. We have a uh, time flies when we're having fun <laughs> at 15 minutes to here things that you're wondering about or maybe wanting to share or experiences you've had, I'd love to open up the discussion. Hi, Heather. Um, and this is great. And I'm, I love watching everything changing here. I just, I'm gonna throw in a comment and. I believe this is the end of your present. Are we at the end of your presentation? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So I'll I'll encourage if people want to turn their cameras back on and unmute, um, so we can chat a little bit. We have about fourteen minutes, give or take. Um, I just wanted to because I've gone from you know te the teaching um, into various roles at the college, and and I'll circle back to the teaching. But that whole premise of having an encouraging and positive environment um, goes across. I mean, not just with students in classrooms, but really with our peers, with our colleagues, um, with our with our teams. Um, you know, I, I think it's it's, and that's probably why it was up there at the top uh, this whole time that people are choosing what they would do. I think we even, I mean, with our families, um, 
right? Coworkers, wh whatever you want to, wherever you want to apply that, I think it's valid. Um, so probably for me, that would be the, the top. And then you've got some amazing tools and techniques that you use after. So thank you for that. I'm going to open it up. I'm going to see if anyone, um, because the chat was uh, super chatty, which was wonderful. And you did a great job at addressing all the questions. Thank you so much. This is a great time for people to um, share some comments, um, more questions, get some discussion flow going. And, and you know, let's use up the last few minutes. Uh, if you want to uh, unshare, and remember, we're going to be posting everything, folks. So I'll send out an email once that's done. Um, and if if you guys want to get back on the screen and see each other, uh, that would be wonderful. And let's just get a little bit of conversation going. Um, Emily, Natalia, Fresina, I mean, you know, you guys have all been, um, Cassia, you guys have all been super chatty with a lot of great information. So now's a good time to just throw it out there if you want. And Emily, I love that quote. I, every time I see it, I never get bored of it. The one that you posted earlier. Thank you for that. I just Sean's think Sean's been quiet. I see Sean, but he's been quiet. Oh, come on now. <laughs> Sorry, Emily. Oh, I was just going to say, I just think that, um, I mean, as Heather pointed out, so many things that we did as teachers in elementary school apply. I mean, they're just bigger um, students with the same fears and concerns and goals. And so, you know, what works for younger kids, you know, can often work uh, with older students. And you know, I always say like math is never learned in isolation. It's all about a math community and that's who we are. And we were helping each other across the finish line. And that has set the tone from the very beginning. So I appreciate that, that it came up to our first um, point was uh, an engaging, supportive community, right? I agree, Emily, that's a very good point. I've also, so I, um, some of you may or may not know, I'm, I'm actually trained as a um, elementary teacher as well. And then I upped it to secondary and then I went into college. So I've taught grade one through 12 as well. And you're hundred percent right. Um, it, it applies right across the board. And if any, I mean, it's, it's important to start in kindergarten and just move its way up. Hi, Nilu, go ahead. Hello everyone. I just have a question. Uh, uh, Heather, I uh, in my class I didn't I give feedback one by one on one on one for quizzes and tests. I just did the solution after quiz and test, and I asked them to go through their own paper and just a solution because I was thinking it's not great that I circle mistakes when they go through it. They see what they did right, it will be repeated for them and what they didn't do right. And they would see, okay, so what was my mistake here? So is this similar to what, I mean, you were thinking, number one question, then number two, I didn't see them too keen about that. And so some of they, they didn't do it. And some of them, they came to me and asked, um, yes, I went through, but I didn't see my mistakes. And I, I could realize that they didn't, they didn't go through it and they wanted me to tell them mistake number one, mistake number two. So I wanted them to see their paper and see if something was correct, was repeated for them and something was wrong, what was wrong and what they could do to make it correct. So maybe they made them negative, maybe just a negative sign or maybe they changed it uh, from this side of the equation to the that side and they didn't change the sign so it can be just uh, just they they find their mistake but i didn't see them too keen so how do you make them more students to do these things i think with that what you're describing there is a, is a great opportunity for what, what we're talking about here for them to realize what they're doing and get that idea what i would encourage is modeling that maybe earlier with a lower stakes assignment or a lower stakes activity where you start with showing um, mistakes and having them find that mistakes in a more guided environment to start as opposed to just jumping it with a test where you've done this test now 
show me where you went right and wrong. Um, but instead earlier in the course, having activities that here's a student who has done a question and it might not even be a real student. It might be you highlighting common mistakes like negatives, like you were saying, can you find what step the student went wrong on? And maybe they could do that in groups even to start to get that idea of being able to look. Cause I've, I've tried similar things to what you're saying. And I agree with some of them are like, you should tell me what's wrong. I shouldn't have to realize this. And <laughs> you get that pushback. But I think if you model earlier that I, I do this with my, um, my fire life safety group, because their whole job is to troubleshoot panels. And so I'm like, you need to be able to troubleshoot. You need to be able to go in and find a mistake because you can't just replace the whole system. <laughs> you can't. I, I don't do the think alouds with them, but I do the, every week I have, here's a problem. Let's find what stage the person went wrong. And then what did they do wrong? And I, I go one step further and have them think about why might the person have done this wrong? So if it's like I'm missing the negative, instead of them just saying it's wrong and then redoing it. Um, but I find it is something that has to be modeled and taught a little bit because that being able to iterate through each stage, which we do as we're marking, they're just like, well, I want to know if it's right or wrong. They're, they're used to sort of that on off multiple choice type of uh, response, as opposed to there's stages of what you're doing here. So what I've done is like including that earlier and then having that as an opportunity on the test, because then they'll be like, oh, I've tried this every week. So it's not just now. And then also, again, modeling how you would break down a question. So for that activity, sort of starting with an example, here's one, I'm going to go look at this step. I'm checking for these things. So just so they can see, and that might be something that you could even pre-record and have as part of your learning material, as opposed to doing live as an example of here's how I mark a long answer question. Um, these are the things that I look for. This is how I evaluate. This is something I'm hoping to do when I have time, uh, who has time ever, but like with homework questions as well, adding in a little bit more of, if you got this question wrong, here are the things to look for, but even just adding in some prompts with the homework, if that helps. Yeah, Thank thanks for that question. That's a, I, I like that activity. That's a, a definitely a great idea. We have a few minutes left if anyone has any last minute comments or questions for Heather. Now is a great time to do it. Of course, you can reach out to her at any time, um, but please feel free to jump in right now as well. Uh, for Sina, I just posted something. Thanks for that, Priscina. Mm -hmm. That's great. Okay, well, I'm not seeing anything coming up just yet. Um, so I guess we'll slowly start to wrap it up. Heather, did you have any last minute comments you wanted to make to the group before we go? Uh, no, just a, a thank you for engaging throughout and asking questions. This is well, it's newer for me to think about things in more scientific terms, but not new to, to do. So I, I, I appreciate each and every one of you as you've really encouraged me to sort of put myself out there a bit more. And I, I look forward to continuing that communications and uh, mutual support moving through. So thanks so much for, uh, for sharing with me today. Thank you. And I mean, everyone's thanking you right now, but I'm just officially going to thank you as well on behalf of OCMA and Capri's. Uh, somewhere. I mean, he may pop on or off, I'm not sure, but uh, we are all super grateful for you taking the time to join us. And, you know, just in general right now, there's just so many things going on. I think we, you know, so many things going on um, locally, nationally, internationally, it's crazy. Um, I think it's, it's a good thing when we can take a little bit of time to come together and just share some positivity, some best practices, take it away from, you know, and see what we can do to go back to our classrooms and make it a really positive experience for our students. So thank you so much for that. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, it's great to see you. Our hope is to see you again in a few months. The OCMA conference uh, is just around the corner, end of May. It'll be here before you know it. Um, and, you know, we can, uh, Heather, I ain't going to be running with you in the morning, but I will walk. You can just 
jog by me and wave. Um, and, you know, looking forward to connecting with everyone again um, as we move through uh, at the end of the semester and into spring. So thank you so much, everyone. I will share when this has been posted. Have an amazing afternoon and uh, almost weekend in a couple of days. Thanks so thank much. You, thank you, Maria. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Bye. Did you have a question, Sean? I saw the hand there. Oh, uh, no, it's, it's okay. I was just...